today's forum, Rescuing the Republic from the Surveillance State, a conversation with Bill Binney and friends. Now, this is a Schiller Institute gathering, and we have a reason that we are doing this. Uh, some of you know that yesterday there was news that there had been an astrophysical observation of the biggest explosion ever seen in the universe, five times larger than anything else ever witnessed, except it happened 300 million years ago. And from that we see that current events do not exist. Similarly, the idea of physical space-time has taught in most universities the Cartesian coordinate system of right, left, up, down, back, and forward is not real. Einstein's conception of the universe, a relativistic physical space-time, is what you actually live in. Most perception is illusion. The five senses do not tell you what reality is. And when you were dealing with the present circumstances that have suddenly engulfed the world, there is an opportunity to suddenly realize that when you walk into a room, switch on the lights, and the water comes on, it's time to change your axioms. So we're starting today with a statement, which we're going to hear is a recorded statement, uh, from Helga Sepp LaRouche, founder and chairwoman of the Schiller Institute. Uh, we're going to play this first and then get to our first speaker. Hello, I'm Helga Sepp LaRouche, become the worst crisis since the end of World War II. Unless we have a change in direction, there is very clearly the danger that the whole strategic situation could get completely out of control. <coughs> and what makes it so difficult is that there are many interacting elements to this crisis. Now let me start with a very worrisome aspect. Despite the fact that President Trump clearly has the intention to improve relations with Russia and China, there are also very different tones coming out of some other parts of the U.S. administration. Recently, U.S. Secretary of Defense Esper was participating personally in a war game which was based on a scenario of a, quote, limited nuclear war between the United States and Russia in Europe, which included the use of so-called low-yield nuclear weapons. Now, recently, the United States did deploy exactly such low-yield warheads on submarine-launched ballistic missiles on the Trident submarines. And that deployment of such so-called low-yield nuclear weapons is very dangerously lowering the threshold of nuclear war. Now, this week, there was a hearing in the Senate Armed Service Committee where the U.S. Air Force General Todd D. Walters, who is also the commander of the U.S. European Command and the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, the so-called SACUR, was asked by Senator Deb Fischer, what are your views about adopting a so-called no-first-use policy? Do you believe that this would strengthen deterrence? And then General Walters said, Senator, I'm a fan of flexible first use policy. Now, this is Dr. Strangelove in the position of the Supreme Commander of the present uh, US forces uh, in Europe. And this is occurring as the Defender 2020 NATO military exercise which is the largest maneuver since the end of the Cold War, is moving tens of thousands of US troops and others like the Bundeswehr to the Russian border for several months of maneuvers. Now, in light of all of this, the spread of the coronavirus, which according to top health officials is only a step away from a pandemic, naturally shows that we are on the verge of an uncontrollable situation. 
In Europe, already most international events and conferences have been cancelled, and the Lombardy region of Italy is now under quarantine. It has been named the Wuhan of Europe. People are being told by the media, by the TV, by the papers to get food reserves for several weeks. And already now, the spread of the coronavirus has a significant impact on the real economy. In China, which has, according to the head of the WHO, set a new standard in the fight against such uh, epidemics, because they put up the defense of life as the first priority and did outstanding measures to contain uh, the spread of the, of the virus. Nevertheless, their GDP in the first quarter will probably go down to 0% as, as distinct of the expected 6%. Now, China probably has the best chance to recover, but for the so-called West, it looks much more grim because the international supply chains have been interrupted and will be interrupted much more. This is now that the effects of the so-called globalization is striking back. The globalization has led to an outsourcing of production into cheap labor markets, such as the food production, which is now no longer under the sovereign control of countries, but under the control of international cartels. We no longer have food security in most countries. Now, the coronavirus if it becomes a pandemic, or even if it spreads to more countries, is in all likelihood becoming the trigger for the financial meltdown. Uh, this is not the cause, but uh, the, the trigger, because this financial system is already at the absolute limit. Since September last year, the Federal Reserve has been pumping unbelievable amounts of money into the system in the form of the so-called so repo loans. The other central banks, the EZB, uh, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan and others have pushed money into the system through quantitative easing, <coughs> negative interest rates and you know this is just absolutely reaching now a, a, an end point, an absolute boundary condition. There is a way out. On January 3rd, when after the assassination of General, the Iranian General Soleimani, and there was for about two days the danger of a very dangerous strategic uh, confrontation, I issued a proposal for an immediate summit between the presidents of the United States, Russia, and China to introduce a new level of cooperation to overcome the danger of geopolitical confrontation. Now, in the meantime, President Putin has made a similar proposal by proposing that the governments of the five permanent UN Security Council countries should have uh, such summits. China and France have already accepted. And today, TASS uh, reports quoting a high-level US official that the United States would be very interested to have such a meeting on the level of the UN Security Council governments for a new arms control agreement. Now, I think that what we have to do is we have to push the agenda of such a summit to, to occur immediately, uh, because I think any delay, uh, given the dangers of the military situation and the dangers of the pandemic, the dangers of the financial system, any postponement uh, is really not, uh, not, not very meaningful. And this summit must adopt what Lyndon LaRouche has proposed with his four laws, uh, a global class legal banking separation, the introduction of a national bank in every country, then fixed exchange rates among these different nations and clearly defined infrastructure and development plans which then can become, as a totality, a new Bretton Woods system, and then have an international crash program for reaching a new level in the productivity of the world economy by focusing on a crash program on fusion power, on uh, optical biophysics and other life uh, sciences, and international space cooperation. 
Now, this is a moment of extraordinary danger, and we could lose human civilization. But if enough forces around the world join in our mobilization to bring this new paradigm about, it could also be the beginning of a completely new epoch. There has been one man who proposed and prognosed all of these developments as early as August 1971. And that is my late husband, Lyndon LaRouche, who, when Nixon basically abandoned the fixed exchange rate system and decoupled the dollar from the gold standard, Lyndon LaRouche said, this, if this tendency is being continued, it will lead either to the danger of a new fascism and depression or a just new world economic order will be implemented. Now, he also worked out the solutions, what can be done, which we have published and will continue to publish uh, much, much more. Therefore, I think that the exoneration of Lyndon LaRouche who was innocently put in jail by the same apparatus which was involved in Russia Gate and the impeachment effort against President Trump. His exoneration will be key for the implementation of this program I just mentioned. To get mankind out of the present danger and into a new era, I think is absolutely linked to the exoneration of Lyndon LaRouche. Therefore, I'm appealing to all of you to join the fight for the exoneration of Lyndon LaRouche and the implementation of his ideas. This is the very best thing you can do to secure the future. Who is on this stage? And what has happened to the people on this stage? What happened to Lyndon what happened to you? Thank you? People like to talk about something they call the deep state. We don't mind that. But we know that it is neither a state nor is it deep. <laughs> we know, those of us that have been involved from those early days of the 70s in some cases and later in other cases, that you're talking about an imperial force and it's an imperial force that terrifies a lot of people. But it mainly terrifies them because they refuse to submit themselves to rigorous thought in the service of bold action. That's all the problem is. The problem is not involved secret police and funny uh, microchips and weird drugs and subliminal messages and all those other things. It involves the inability to look into oneself and admit that the actions taken by people like Martin Luther King or the actions taken by people like Malcolm X or the actions taken by JFK are only characteristic of the actions that all of us must take in the context of what we have been confronted with ever since the 1960s, particularly coming out of the United States. It doesn't originate in the United States, but it will only be resolved if people in the United States decide to act. We're starting today with someone who's well known to most, and he and his associate who's with him, Kurt Wiebe, have been fighting for 20 years to tell a story. Uh, they told the story. They told the story 20 years ago. They've been fighting for 20 years to get other people to stand up. Uh, it's important to say that there is a faction of the American military and military intelligence which is patriotic. It's a faction that <coughs> intended to defend the United States. And it's a faction that also intended to make certain kinds of engineering and technical and even scientific breakthroughs on behalf of utilizing technology for positive purposes. William Binney, former intelligence official with the National Security Agency for over a 30-year period, attempted to do that and was prevented at a critical moment 
prior to September 11th of 2001 from doing his job. The United States paid for that. And you can't walk away from that crime. But talking about that from the standpoint of whether the planes were real or how the buildings came down or all these other things doesn't cut it. You have to confront something else. You have to confront what's happening to you right now apart from your partisan beliefs, your political affiliations, you have to confront the fact that something is happening to all of us. And it's your responsibility to listen to the people that can tell you what that is in such a fashion that you can then take the responsibility that many of us all want to take. Bill has spoken to several audiences, including the one here three years ago in Symphony Space. And we're happy to have him here with us today. And so without further need to say anything, I'd like you to join me in welcoming William Denny, NSA Whistleblower. Uh, yeah, as uh, uh, Dennis has said, uh, the government, we had opted for bulk acquisition for two basic reasons, I think. One, one was set up by Cheney, Dick Cheney, and that was he wanted to know everything about all his potential adversaries, politically or otherwise. And so that meant he had to have information about everybody. And so the bulk acquisition satisfied his need in that respect. But in the other respect, uh, in the bureaucracies uh, of the government, bureaucrats tend to like to get bigger and bigger budgets and bigger and bigger uh, organizations. And so that meant more and more money and more and more influence. So in order to do that, if you opt for this bulk acquisition on everybody so that you can satisfy Cheney's needs, it also requires them, the Congress, to give you much more money so you can build your bureaucracy. And those are the basic, I think, motivations to do this. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> they had known also from the very beginning that there was another solution that would actually do productive things. Because when you took the bulk acquisition, that meant you couldn't see the threats coming. There was just too much data. That's why they hadn't been able to prevent any of the terrorist attacks that have occurred anywhere in the world because all, everybody's adopted this policy and they can't see the threats coming. And this is documented internally in NSA records produced by Edward Snowden and also uh, MI5 and MI6 uh, records and some in GCHQ. They, they are saying, their analysts are set telling them, there's too much data, you've buried us, you've overloaded us, we can't see the threat coming. So. Just for that reason alone, they shouldn't be doing it. But uh, the, 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 the real point is the solution existed all along, and we were developing that in the Thin Thread program. It had basically three, three tenets. Uh, one was a deductive approach, one an abductive approach, and one was an a, a inductive approach. So uh, for the deductive approach, we simply looked at social organizations that stayed within a, uh, the one degree of the known bad guys and did a, uh, a, a serve and used that data to pull out information and only that information from the data flow that we were looking at. And we were looking at the number of terabytes a minute so at the time. And we wanted to uh, up, up that to about 20 terabytes a minute. Uh, that was our approach and uh, that was the deductive side. So that, that was a human behavior property that showed probable cost. You're contacting a terrorist. And, you need to be looked at. That's a fair thing. That's easy to justify in a warrant. And, and in the inductive approach, we used simply, you're looking at sites that are advocating pedophilia or sites that advocate terrorism or violence against the West or bomb making and things like that. And you can try to watch people who visit those sites so that you see, you can see the frequency of visit and say that they are probably getting radicalized or in the process of or you have people who have uh, cell phones in the mountains of Afghanistan or uh, in, uh, satellite phones in the mountains of Afghanistan or the jungles of Peru and you say, well, they're dope or they terror potentials. So you look at that, those kinds of things. So that's kind of the inductive approach. So far, those two approaches would have caught every terrorist attack in the world before, during, and after 9-11. Everyone. 
But did we do that? No, because, because that's a focused, disciplined, professional attack on the data against and, and against bad behavior by people, indicating potential threats. Uh, and the abduct approach is a little more abstract. It says you look at geographical distribution. If you have a network that's uh, at one degree that is distributed on countries that uh, are involved in terrorist advocation or something like that, you need to look at them to see if they're, uh, they're terrorist or any way affiliated with a terrorist attack or a terrorist organization. Uh, and, and, uh, once you, and once you look at them, if they're not, then you uh, take them out. And you simply say they're, they're out. And the rest of the data you simply let go right by. And what that does is that gives everybody in the world privacy. And it, and it respects the constitutional rights and privacy rights of everybody in this country and every country in the world. Plus, it, it creates a, a, an extremely rich environment for analysts to succeed at preventing threats and, and uh, potential adversarial attacks. That's the, that's the whole point. That was the whole point of why we did the thin thread to begin with, because even back then, our, our analysts were very good. So the end result is that today we have a situation where the, the key point here is NSA database, uh, uh, databasing of information. Because our country is the only country in the world that can afford all the data storage that can store all the information they're collecting. I mean, they're collecting you know, multiple petabytes a day. So uh, my estimate of the Utah storage facility alone was based on Cisco routers being put into it. And what they were estimating was not, uh, 966 exabytes of data going into that data center uh, a year uh, by 2015. So I figured they had to have at least five years worth of storage capacity, which meant five zettabytes, which is much less than a yottabyte, but still it's quite a bit. <laughs> and after that, we get a bunch of bytes and a lot of bytes. And all that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we, those it haven't been named above a yottabyte, but. Uh, so, uh, but, but the point is, NSA is the key element here because it's a storage facility for not just the NSA, all of the agencies of the United States government, all the Five Eyes and all the uh, nine other countries that are participating with them in this worldwide collection of data and bulk acquisition on everybody on the planet. And all we would have to do is take our, our rule, deducted, inducted, adducted, take those rules and run it and process the entire database that's stored and pull out only that which is relevant then purge the rest of it. At that point, there would be no data available for anybody like in the US government or the British government or anywhere to use against their people. So they couldn't be abused. So that would fix the problem. That would mean the FBI, the DEA, and the DOJ, or anybody in the intelligence community or in the Five Eyes, or any of the others, could not go into that database and find information on any one citizen unless that citizen had probable cause, warrant-based uh, evidence that they should be there. And that's the way to fix this whole problem, and do it rather quickly, because once you retake that data out, no one has the ability to abuse it. say that we're going to have an extensive Q&A session, so anybody who will have particular questions, you'll be able to ask those questions. What Bill says done is provide the solution, and that's what we ask them to do. We're going to next hear from Kirk Weeby. I don't think a lot of people know much about Kirk, and I'll just say the following, that he and Bill and another gentleman by the name of Ed Loomis developed what is called the Thin Thread System. This was referred to just a minute ago by Bill. And, uh, I'm going to let Kirk tell you a little bit. He has a very specific view about the relationship between intelligence and the Constitution. Kirk? Yeah. Hello. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you to the LaRouche organization for making this possible and for uh, inviting us to address these fine people before us. Um, a lot of people don't realize it, but the, the National Security Agency, and I'm going to pick on them because I've worked there for a long time with uh, Bill, um, has operated unconstitutionally for about 70% of the time it has existed on the planet. Now, 
What do I mean by that? Well, the people in charge, namely the executive, namely the legislative branches of government, have formed a cabal, a cartel, if you will, that has decided to mass surveil the world, stuff the information in a database somewhere, big ones, and claim that they're not violating your rights under the Constitution. Because they say, yeah, we collected it, although they won't overtly admit it. But we haven't looked at it. And if we haven't looked at it, it hasn't meant anything to an official in the government. Now, if we go back to the late 1700s, just before the outbreak of our famous Revolutionary War, King George of England, uh, it's documented, wanted to put a red coat, a British soldier, in the home of every colonial settler in the United States. And why do you think he wanted to do that? You know the answer. He wanted to know what they were thinking and doing. Let me suggest to you that with all the electronic devices, you know, if I asked any one of you, how many electronic devices connected to the internet does your family have? I know it's more than one. Probably four. What do you think? More? I agree. The point is this. Each of those are sources of information about you and those who you love the most. Every detail, every thought that's communicated via those devices can be collected and put in a database. And when someone decides you're important for some reason, it could be anything. Somebody wants to blackmail you. Somebody wants to scam you. You know, the only difference between a good person and a bad person in government is what? What is it? Yeah, really, it's opportunity. And do you have what we would call moral clarity? But beyond that, do you have a sense of what's right and wrong in this nation? The founding document of which is the United States Constitution, and do you care? Well, I would submit to you, we have in the news events going on, namely the attack using the weaponized sources of the intelligence community to subvert a duly elected president. If that's not a warning, what do, they, what do you think they could do to one of you, or three of you, or Bill and me, or anyone else? So the threat is real, it has been abused, and it lies at the feet of people who are greedy for power. It didn't start out that way. It started out nobly. But now we've reached a point where people have decided they know better, they know best how to manage all of our lives. And it's not just an essay anymore. Google knows what you're doing. Facebook knows what you're doing. Instagram knows what you're doing. We are being, you know, it's, pro it's proliferating everywhere, and now we have the Internet of Things where even your refrigerator can talk to the Internet. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Your whole lives are stuck in a database. So the point of it is, Bill has suggested that there's a way to put the genie back in the box, but it's going to be you who makes it happen. Don't expect some senator, don't expect some congressman, with the exception of Chief of CIA Pompeo inviting Bill to talk about the DNC Data Act. Uh, no member of government has ever approached him or me and said, would you come talk to a few congressmen about what's happened, your ideas for fixing it? No. Why? 
They like it the way it is. Your data is available to anyone in 16 agencies within the intelligent and law, law enforcement communities. That's the threat, and only we can change it. Thank you. Hear now from Mike Billington, and Mike is going to tell you a bit about himself. He is, as is listed here in your little program, Executive Intelligence Review Asia editor. He's author of a book called Reflections of an American Political Prisoner. Mike uh, was offered, I'd rather I say it than he has to say it, after two trials, one trial in which he served two or three years, was offered a plea bargain which would have meant that he would have simply served time, the time served, no time would have been additional. And all he had to do was claim to be guilty of something of which he was not. A lot of his friends would have had a big problem. And Mike decided, you know what, I don't think I'm going to do that. Uh, despite the fact that his own attorney has to be replaced, Despite the fact that Mike said he would replace him, the judge in the case refused to do that, and Mike was given a 77-year sentence. He served eight years of it. Is that the price you have to pay for integrity in this country? Now, if it is, I will submit to all of you, as you listen to him, you think about whether or not that's the kind of country you want to live in. Mike Millington. Thank you, um, I, if, if any of you have a sense that calling for the exoneration of Lyndon LaRouche is, is a pipe dream or that you know, Trump would never do this, I want you to put that out of your minds and I'll, I'll try to prove that. Um, this is a rare, rare moment in history for many reasons. But one, which I will address, is that this is in fact the time that the exoneration of LaRouche is both possible, absolutely necessary, and will transform not just the nation, but the world for forever. Uh, and I want to try to convey that in as clear a way as I possibly can. Let's start by looking at the fact that just last week, uh, Donald Trump pardoned or commuted the sentence of 11 people. Some of them were people who, like myself and my co-defendants, were innocent and were uh, illegally and, uh, and unjustly charged and tried and, and sent to prison. Others did commit crimes, but they were subjected to outrageous sentences uh, in order to, not just to silence them, but to terrorize other people. Uh, the fact that Trump did this and that he also addressed quite publicly and at some length the issue of Roger Stone uh, and the fact that, as he said, he will probably be exonerated one way or another means that this is very, very much on Donald Trump's mind. Uh, and I'll mention that Roger Stone, who is someone who has quite publicly addressed Lyndon LaRouche as one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, has interviewed him, has spoken at our conferences, is very well known to the uh, criminal network within the criminal justice system who have run the entire operation against Trump, against uh, Roger Stone and others. And I'll come back to that. The, um, one of the people uh, released by, by Donald Trump was Ron Blagojevich, who paper I do not have. Somehow I don't have what I wanted to read to you. I will convey in, in brief some of what he said the day he came out where he and his wife and his two daughters met outside the house and he addressed the fact, first of all, that there was no way to thank President Trump for freeing a man from a charge which uh, he had not committed. There was no way to, to thank him 
Uh, he said that Trump is a very firm leader, a very tough leader, but also has a huge heart, and that releasing Blagojevich was an act of <coughs> kindness, which people had to recognize. Uh, he then went on to say uh, that uh, what had, that he had not, to the people of Illinois who had elected him twice as governor, he said, I did not let you down. I would have let you down had I given in to this, if I had admitted guilt to something I didn't do, if I had gone along in order to save myself this 14-year sentence, of which he served eight years. Uh, and he then quoted from a Supreme Court justice, uh, Justice Breyer, uh, who said that the idea that people in, in politics and the political world could be charged criminally for what they're supposed to do as politicians is one of the greatest threats to America today. This is a Supreme Court justice. And that in particular, he said, prosecutors armed with this, with this potential is a grave danger to our system of government. And Blagojevich said he, had, he learned that the hard way, as many of us did. But I think it's extremely important that you have people at that level directly addressing the uh, broken criminal justice system that existed, he has specifically said, since 1994 when this Crime Act was passed, which was a disaster, which he described as a, as a racist and illegal uh, act. The Linda LaRouche, long before that, was convicted uh, and served uh, five years of a 15-year sentence from, from, 19, from 1990 to 1995. Uh, he could have been exonerated by President Clinton. Clinton was considering it. Literally tens of thousands of leading uh, citizens of this nation and from around the world wrote to Clinton calling for him to pardon and exonerate Leonard LaRouche. But he didn't. Uh, he did make sure that LaRouche was released after the, the first uh, pardon potential, not pardon, uh, parole potential after five years. So he served five years of that 15 year sentence. When he was released, uh, he organized here in Virginia a forum before a, a, a panel of very distinguished jurists and political leaders and others. Uh, testimony on the LaRouche case and on other cases of, of the misuse of the criminal justice system. Uh, in particular, the Furmension case, which was the uh, official FBI doctrine that any black elected official was, by the fact of being black, more prone to corruption and therefore legitimate to be investigated. Uh, in that hearing, um, I want to read what, some of what Lynn said himself in that testimony. He said, we have, in my view, a system, and this is long before the 1990s and 9-11, this is back in, in, the, in the 1980s. We have, in my view, a system of injustice whose center within the Department of Justice, especially the criminal division of the U.S. Department of Justice. The problem lies not with one administration or another, though one administration or another may act more positively or more negatively, but it's the permanent civil service employees who are coordinators of a nest of institutions in the criminal division which show up repeatedly as leading or key associates of every legal atrocity which I have seen. In my case, when the time came that somebody wanted me out of the way, they were able to rely upon that permanent injustice in the permanent bureaucracy of government to do the job. Always there's that agency inside the Justice Department which works for a contract, like a hitman. When somebody with the right credentials and passwords walks in and says, we want to get this group of people, or we want to get this person. And until we remove from our system of government the rotten permanent bureaucracy which acts like contract assassins using the authority of the justice system to perpetrate assassination, this country is not free, nor anyone in it. Odin Anderson, uh, Lynn's lawyer, then presented a series of documents which we'd obtained through Freedom of Information from the FBI, and I'll just briefly mention. It included uh, the uh, idea of putting out false leaflets under the, the LaRouche organization's name going back into the 1960s and 70s. 
it included Henry Kissinger's letter to the head of the FBI saying, can't you get this guy? He's being very obnoxious. Uh, a letter from the director of the FBI to some of his subordinates saying, let's investigate him under, as a, if we don't know where his money comes from, uh, let's investigate him as being funded by a foreign hostile force, which then uh, calls into being uh, Executive Order 12333, which basically says somebody financed by a foreign hostile force, you can throw the Constitution out and do whatever you want, uh, and others of this sort. Uh, so this, this was well documented. And then, <clears throat> then Ramsey Clark spoke. And Ramsey Clark, I'm sure most of you know, was the Attorney General of the United States <coughs> under uh, President Johnson. And he became our lawyer for the appeal when we were first convicted in the federal case. Uh, and here's what he said, first of all, in a letter that he wrote to Janet Reno, then the Attorney General, same position he had held. He says, this case, the LaRouche case, believes, I believe, involves a broader range of deliberate and systemic misconduct and abuse of power over a longer period of time in an effort to destroy a political movement and leader than any other federal prosecution in my time or to my knowledge. A tragic miscarriage of justice. In the testimony of the same hearings that Mr. LaRue spoke in, he said, uh, what was a complex and pervasive utilization of law enforcement, prosecution, media, and non-governmental organizations, those NGOs, those no good organizations, uh, focused on destroying an enemy. This case must be number one. Uh, the purpose can only be seen as destroying more than a political movement, more than a political figure. It is those two, but it's a fertile engine of ideas and a common purpose of thinking and studying and analyzing to solve problems regardless of the impact on the status quo or on vested interests. It was the deliberate purpose to destroy that at any cost. So this is what the LaRouche case was and was recognized increasingly by many people. That's why they had to destroy him and try to poison his name in the media, to prevent these ideas from being placed at the accessibility of the American and world population. Now, clearly, it's exactly this same network that uh, went after Donald Trump. I don't think I have to explain that. It's pretty obvious. In terms of my own case, I think to get at that, I want to say something else about Roger Stone. Um, you probably all watched the raid, the great raid on Roger Stone's house. <clears throat> A 66-year-old man with no criminal record attacked at, what, 5 in the morning or something like that, with, of course, CNN standing out there. Everybody watched this horrible criminal being put in handcuffs and dragged off. Well, I'm very familiar with that scene. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, on, on October 6th, 1986, the day of what we called the Big Panty Raid in Leesburg, uh, armed forces from many different uh, law enforcement uh, agencies uh, raided our offices, surrounded Linda LaRouche's house, and when my wife got up that morning and was taking the, uh, the garbage down to the end of our lane, she saw a whole slew of armed men in police cars and CNN ready to come in, for some reason not coming in immediately. So we called our neighbors, John and, and Renee Sigerson, who happened to live near us at that time, and said, why don't you come over while we wait until they come in and arrest me? And so we were sitting there watching the Marriage of Figaro, I think, on a video. <laughs> when these men finally decided to come running up the road with their guns drawn and surrounded the house and pulled me out and put me in chains and <laughs> took me off and so forth. Why? And CNN, my wife came out and said, get the hell off my yard, you have no right to be here. So <laughs> that was, so this, this is, this is uh, something that was going on then and is going on now. Uh, in my case, there was something of this deep state, so-called, directly involved. Um, a, a fellow named Oliver North, some of you probably remember, who was at that time running through the so-called Iran-Contra operation, a scam where we were arming terrorists in Nicaragua. Uh, and the planes unloading the guns that were being shipped down to them, uh, just as we were shipping weapons to Al-Qaeda in Libya and so forth. Um, we're coming back loaded up with cocaine. We exposed that, that this was a drug running operation. 
and that Oliver North, a good friend of Henry Kissinger and others, uh, was running this scam. Uh, and then I, I, we found out that, uh, that Ali North was also running around raising huge amounts of money, stealing really, huge amounts of money from people, telling them that this was to fight communism, it was to save America, and so forth, when in fact it was financing arms running and, and drug running. And one of the people they scammed was somebody who was a major contributor to us, and with, in whom I was in regular contact. <coughs> Oliver North told her that you have bad people who are trying to undermine your doing good things. Uh, therefore, you should let me tap your phone, which was done. And they monitored our calls. Uh, this was not just to get me, but it was to be fully on top of exactly what we were doing as an organization at that time. So um, I think that's the reason I was hit particularly hard with the indictments. I was indicted both in the federal case and in the Virginia State case. Uh, the railroad, as we called it, went forth. We were all convicted. I won't go through the ugly details, but it's worth reading. Uh, and I got three years in the, in the federal case, and then, as, as Dennis explained, I was told in the state case where I was charged with crimes that could have been 90 years uh, that I simply had to lie, and I could go home. Uh, so that didn't happen, and as a result, I got a 77-year sentence. Many of the people I met in prison when I said I had a 77-year sentence said, how many bodies do you got? <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I did not, uh, and I want to read something that Dennis actually read at a previous event and which really struck me from Martin Luther King. He said, you may be 38 years old as I happen to be. And one day, some great opportunity stands before you and calls you to stand up for some great principle, some great issue, some great cause. And you refuse to do it because you're afraid. You refuse to do it because you want to live longer. You're afraid that you'll lose your job. You're afraid you will be criticized or that you'll lose your popularity. Or you're afraid that somebody will stab you or shoot you or bomb your house. And so you refuse to take the stand. Well, you may go on and live until you're 90, but you're just as dead at 38 as you would be at 90. And the cessation of breathing in your life is but the belated announcement of an earlier death of spirit. And I can assure you that my life is a proof of that fact. Because I did have to spend a total of 10 years in prison. Uh, but <laughs> I can honestly say these were the best years of my life. Uh, that, um, my, my only problem with my fellow inmates was my trying to convince them that this was the only chance they had in life where they didn't have to work, they didn't have to support a family, they should learn, they should read, they should not waste away feeling sorry for themselves. But I was given, really, the assignment of China. I mean, 77 years, you know, you've got 5,000 years of history to study. You need 77 years to take that on. But it became a real passion. Uh, it was something we needed to do. Uh, my co-defendant, Will Wirtz, was at the time translating Nicholas of Cusa, who was the relatively unknown great uh, mind uh, of, the of the European Renaissance era. Uh, and I was then reading Confucius and Mencius and another relatively unknown but magnificent figure called Zhu Xi during the Song Dynasty in the 12th century and saw the comparison between what I was reading of Kuza and what I was reading of these Chinese and was able to pull together a sense of the way in which the great Christian Renaissance of Europe and the Confucian Renaissance where Zhu Xi, like, uh, like Kuza, was restoring the Platonic tradition and the Confucian tradition, which had been lost over the Dark Ages in both Europe and, and China. So this was a, uh, it was a profound uh, chance for me to really make great discoveries, which enriched my life and, and, I, and through my work hopefully enriched the world and made uh, those who put me in prison very sorry that they'd given me the opportunity <coughs> to do that. Uh, and then lastly, I'll say that there was a, a one particularly um, profound experience. At, at one point, another of my co-defendants, um, Paul Gallagher, uh, and I were in the same, <coughs> same, 
same prism. <laughs> and we formed a classical chorus. <laughs> so we had a chorus of people, of criminals, some fairly serious criminals, child molesters, murderers, um, but people who, with one exception, had never participated in any kind of classical music, totally unfamiliar with classical music, had never tried to sing. But we had been trained in some bel canto methods, uh, and we began to train them. And we sang Bach, and we sang Schubert, and we sang some Negro spirituals. And in particular, we sang Beethoven. Now, this is the year of Beethoven. Our theme is to think like Beethoven. Many of you may have seen Helga Zepp-Larouche two weeks ago, gave a forum here in New York <coughs> from Germany, on Fidelio, the great opera by, by Beethoven, in which uh, the, uh, the lady, Leonora, uh, dresses as a boy, Fidelio, uh, and goes and to work for the warden of a prison where she believes her husband is being held illegally and secretly by a tyrant. And through this story, she eventually frees her husband. And this is a very powerful story, and you can imagine why Helga loves this story uh, with uh, Lynn having been in prison this time. And I had a similar experience. My late wife at that time <coughs> traveled the world meeting with uh, presidents and world courts and so forth, addressing this injustice to Lyndon LaRouche. So in one scene in this great opera is called The Prisoner's Chorus. This is where Leonora Fidelio succeeds in getting the warden to let the prisoners out for just a moment uh, to get some fresh air. And they come out and sing this male chorus uh, called uh, um, O Belge Lust, O What Joy, to breathe the fresh air again. And they think about freedom, 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 Freiheit, Freiheit. But then they remember that they're being watched and they sort of skulk back into their cells. Well, we, we sang this at, at the prison. And it had that in particular, the whole thing, but that in particular, that Beethoven principle, had a profound effect in every one of those people. <clears throat> and I've told this story before, and I tend to choke up when I say it. But every one of them, at some point afterwards, came up to me to um, try to express that they had never known of this kind of beauty in the world. Uh, and let, <coughs> excuse me, let alone that they could participate in the creation of that kind of beauty. So, <coughs> so when Lyndon LaRouche uh, launched the Manhattan Project here in New York <coughs> with the intention of creating a vast chorus that would sing both the classical repertoire and the Negro spirituals because these were not just popular music or, or gospels, these were songs that were about the fight for freedom and had a classical nature in that sense. I understood exactly what he meant. That this was the way in which we can build the necessary movement for, <coughs> for a true renaissance. So the Schiller Institute's, <coughs> the Schiller Institute's motto has always been the Schiller motto, that the path to truth is through beauty. Uh, and the, the, this is an example of why building this course, there was a, there was a music event last night, and I understand that those people who went and, and participated in the music, who were being recruited to our political ideas, but it's through participating in this kind of great culture which we've lost in America, with the ugliness that outpasses for culture, that this is the way we create the potential to reverse the decay and the, the collapse of the civilization that we're living in and actually creating the new paradigm that Helga addressed. So <clears throat> um, I think uh, this is why if we make this possible, that LaRouche is exonerated by a President Donald Trump who wants to achieve what he says in terms of bringing the world together around these powerful ideas of development of science, of cooperation, and great culture that all of these ideas of this brilliant man, these beautiful ideas, will be made available to everyone, which has been denied them for these last 40 or 50 years, uh, which is the great crime of the persecution of the LaRouche, that these ideas were prevented from being known and, and uh, uplifting the population. So this is where we stand, <coughs> and I think this is why we have this kind of a fight to expose and destroy 
whether you call it deep state, British intelligence, destroy those who have, have purposely set out to destroy both the culture as well as the economy and the uh, participation of our citizens in this point of commitment to what, in fact, can and must be a new paradigm. Thank you. I'm not going to do that right now. I actually, no, I'm going to tell you why. Because you have a moment of tension. Don't let the tension go by. Because you have to ask yourself a question. How does somebody like that spend 10 years in jail? And you and I don't do anything about it. It's not a question of guilt. Because the issue is, how many other people is that happening to? How many people without movements? How many people that don't have the words? How many of the people who just are trying to live their lives? And because of surveillance, and because of ambition, greed, or who knows what, they are suddenly swept up in a process which is not personal, but it's a collapse of a civilization. And it victimizes us all, unless, unless we take the ideas that you've heard and fight back. Now, what I'm going to do is, uh, I think we have a, some microphones, uh, I believe, and uh, I'm going to take a question from the audience, but I'm going to take one which was texted, because this was re ref uh, to, to Bill, and it may probably help get some other things going. So, Bill, I'm going to, I got a question for you. This is about, uh, well, it's really about Russia. Games. The specific question is, can you address the reliance on CrowdStrike? Why is the intelligence community relying on CrowdStrike? I think you should explain to people what that is so they know, and then just do your age. Well, uh, well, I was telling uh, Michael here that uh, basically they tried to do the same thing to us, put us in jail under, uh, under the espionage law, the 1917 espionage law. They were threatening to indict us on that. Uh, and uh, the only reason they didn't was because I had uh, assembled evidence of malicious prosecution on the part of the Department of Justice. And so I, I threatened them with that and publicly, uh, or over the phone, read to uh, Tom Drake, whom I knew his phone was tapped by the FBI, so I was really talking to the FBI guy on the side. And I was reading all the evidence I had about malicious prosecution, so I, and I told Tom, because they were going to indict us. So I told him, I said, when they indict us, uh, tell your lawyer we're going to charge them with malicious prosecution when they take us to court. And then I hung up. And that's the only reason that we were in jail, like you. That was the point I was trying to make. That's, that was the connection that I had with well, the other, we all had. The other, thing I'd like you to do, the other thing I'd like you to do is to say a bit, because you guys both got raided by yeah. the FBI. Yeah. Just let people know that they are aware of that. Yeah, we, uh, we uh, also, uh, uh, Kirk Leaving, uh, uh, Diane Bork, and uh, Ed Loomis and I signed a uh, uh, DOD IG complaint against the uh, NSA for corruption, fraud, waste, and abuse. And we're required to do that, by the way, by regulation. And so when we did that, uh, that was in uh, September of 2002, they sent a team of inspectors out, about 12 of them, to investigate uh, the uh, NSA. And it took them two and a half years, and a part of that process, NSA tried to subvert their investigation, and they found out about it, of course, and they, they came back on them for that. But, that, so there was only more more corruption uh, evidence of corruption there, and so they found out everything we had said was true, everything, you know, and uh, and so uh, that was sitting there, and that caused NSA a lot of problems. Uh, in fact, at the time, the report that the DoD issued in 2005 was suppressed; it wasn't distributed like normal reports would be, because it was too damning to NSA, because it exposed so many so much of the corruption and fraud. Uh, wasting of tens of billions of dollars, and so uh, that was uh, uh, <clears throat> that was the the part that left 
them with a very bad taste and a vendetta to get us somehow. So in 2007, after the New York Times article about the uh, warrantless wiretapping program, which is only a minuscule part of what they were really doing, uh, uh, they, they, they thought, the D, well, actually the DODIG, the Inspector General himself, gave our names as potential uh, leakers to the New York Times for that article. Of course, we weren't. And uh, they knew that, of course, because they had all our phone calls, emails, and everything, because they collected it with the bulk acquisition at the time. And we knew that, too. So, uh, uh, so uh, <laughs> they, uh, they uh, still trumped up this charge of this basic... Uh, they said we had some other agency's sensitive data, and they raided us, all four of us. The ones who, only the, those of us who signed the, uh, the complaint against the NSA. So that we got raided on the 26th of July of 2007. Very similar to Roger Stone, with only about half as many agents, but in, in guns drawn, in my case. And uh, so uh, that, that uh, they, everybody else seemed to get a little uh, disturbed and taken aback by the thing. And I, all I was doing was at the time getting rather angry at them for being there. So I started accusing them of things like, uh, you were sent here by somebody outside the FBI, right? And uh, of course, the, it's like kids getting their, caught with their hand in a cookie jar. You know, you could see their physical body reaction that says that was absolutely right. And the guy who did it was uh, uh, Gonzalez, I'm sure, the Attorney General at the time, because he, he uh, this was the morning of the second day after his testimony to the Senate Judiciary Committee giving explaining the uh, terrorist surveillance program, for which he only talked about the minuscule part, you know, the warrantless wiretap that was exposed by the president. Well, we, we knew all the rest of it, and, and uh, we also had a, had a propensity to go to committees in Congress and tell them the truth, uh, which, of course, the administration didn't. So uh, <clears throat> they, they wanted to silence us, not keep us off balance, and so on. That's why they did the raid. So. But at any rate, uh, the whole thing came out in the end. Uh, they, they, they ran away after we exposed the, all their malicious attempts at prosecution, and we haven't heard from them since. Kirk, I'd like you to do one thing here, which is to explain to people what it is that in your Thin Thread program became uh, so threatening. That is to say, you guys figured out how to do things very efficiently, and go ahead. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> You know, uh, a number of years had passed, and uh, I would find myself thinking, what nation would attack the very people developing the most advanced capabilities within the lawful guidelines of the Constitution? To find bad people to prevent attacks, to prevent crime, whatever it may be. Why? It was anathema to me. I, I couldn't figure it out. And I wasn't street smart enough to realize that evil exists in the highest levels of government. You, you don't want to admit that. You want to have faith in your government. And it was a shocking reality that hit me upside the head and said, my God, it is that simple evil wants to control the outcome. So, my belief is that ultimately it was their fear of us providing capabilities that if they were in the hands of a number of people searching through data uh, scooped up by the NSA and others, that we would see things being done by the, by the very perpetrators within government that were unconstitutional and evil. And it's for that reason that they erased literally all the hard drives of the capabilities that we have developed. That shocking reality. One other thing while you have the microphone and then what we'll do everybody is we'll take a break after this for 10 minutes. So everybody can get your questions ready, and then we'll just go at it. Uh, explain what happened with the individual that came to see you guys. His name is Black. Was that his name? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is very interesting and very telling. <clears throat> I remember when Bill was there. The deputy director of NSA, 
who was the man most influential in getting this guy promoted to the senior ranks of technical director at NSA, said, I want to come down and see what you've developed. And we were joyous about that. Here's the deputy director. We've been fighting to get clarity and understanding and sharing what uh, successes we had had. Here's the second man in charge coming down, and he did. And we sat around the table and showed him, and he said this, and I quote, my God, you have made major breakthroughs. Why are you being so modest? We weren't being modest, but the levels in between us in a lab atmosphere and all the layers of bureaucracy up to him weren't letting the word get out because they wanted dollars. They wanted to win. There was a, a, what I would call an unhealthy competitiveness amongst organizations within the government. And so it was really bad in terms of a great outcome for the American people. And, and uh, so we were very excited by his comments. It certainly meant for us that he would go back up to the ninth floor of NSA and share what he had seen with the director, none other than uh, Lieutenant General Michael V. Hayden, United States Air Force. We never heard from the ninth floor again. Not again. It was clear, and we saw this reinforced later, that Hayden had told Bill Black to shut up. Because it was his agenda that he wanted Congress to hear, not what was going down in terms of our success story. Yeah. So what we'll do is we'll take a break. It is now 6-11. So why don't we take a 10-minute break? You know, that'll stretch it out. But uh, do that. Let me also point out to people that there's this book by Mike Billington, Reflections of an American Code. Segments, there were holes in the time sequence in the, by July, and all those were filled by the data from 1 September. So that says he made one download, split it into two files, did a range change on the date and a range change on the hour, and that's all he had to do. He couldn't do a range change on a minute because of cross minutes or multiple minutes. He couldn't certainly do it on seconds. It would be impossible to do that. You have to handle every second, you know, there's too many changes. So, but he could do the hour and the, and the date change, and the, with a range change. But then there was another part of it, too, that uh, came out a little bit later, more recently, and that's uh, the, the guys in the UK found uh, five items from Booster 2's post in the 15th of June, the early June, where he put it out there and said the Russians did the hack because here is the Here's, uh, here's all the signatures with Russian fingerprints on it, some Cyrillic and things like that. Anything that a real uh, spy would never do. But, uh, but I mean, uh, here it is. This, this is evidence that the Russians did it. So we, we, he, we, the five items that he found, that our guys found uh, from that posting that he made on the 15th of June of 2016, they were also posted by WikiLeaks in the Podesta emails. So the same five items are in both places, except in the Podesta emails posted by WikiLeaks, there are no Russian signatures. So that meant, very simply put, Gusper II inserted those signatures into those files to claim that the Russians did the hack. So uh, that, that, meant, that meant, very simply, that Gusper II was an entire fake, and that he was modifying those files, and, and uh, then when you looked at the uh, Vault 7 uh, releases from, uh, posted by WikiLeaks, it uh, gave a program called Marvel Framework, which is one of the attack uh, programs that the uh, CIA would be using, one of tens of thousands of them they had, so in that, uh, in, in that release. And that, that program can do an attack on somebody and make it look like other countries did it. Well, the ones they had that, that they could modify to do it at the time were Russia, China, uh, North Korea, Iran, and Arab countries. <laughs> so that 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 then, uh, along with the in the Marble Framework, it said that that that, that the, this program was used once in 2016. 
Well, it was probably done on 15th of June of 2016 by Gusler II, who was a member of CIA, <laughs> internally in this group in CIA that's involved in the creation of Gusler II and the fabrication of the Russian hack. Uh, this, these are the same people, and in fact, we uh, from another uh, whistleblower who's coming out, we may or may not hear more about this later, later on, and hopefully we do, uh, he is claiming that he set up a program called the Hammer Run, uh, Run for Clapper and Brennan. And that, that program was set up to do spy on Trump and the other people of importance that they viewed that were threats. And this was done separate from everything else in the government, so that all run by a small group within CIA. So that meant that uh, <clears throat> here is a separate, and the reason they had to do it separately, see, if they wanted to spy on, on the President uh, Trump's campaign, or even before the campaign, they'd have to go into the NSA data to do it. And once they did that, there would be a trail record of what they did in the network's logs or in any kind of uh, data request they would make. Those, those things would be recorded and traceable back to them. But when they do it separately with this separate program, the Hammer, Using the same, using some of the software we developed again, uh, because it effectively could uh, download the uh, entire internet. So, uh, <clears throat> in order, they used that to do that and and uh, do it separately with this group, so that there was no traceability anywhere in government. Even DOJ couldn't trace what they did. That was what they were. That's the reason what what they've done and what they tried to do. And this is why. All this Russiagate stuff is a fabrication of CIA and various other participants in the deep state. Yeah, let, let me add one thing. If people say, yeah, but Bill, this is classified information. You know, we can't defend what you're saying. Uh, let me remind people, in uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 1950s, the United States released classified information in the form of photographs of Soviet missiles being delivered, transported by ship, to the island of Cuba. We released it so that people could see it as truth in the face of evil. Again, recently, more recently, 1989, was it when the Korean airline 007 was shot down and all those people died over northern Japan? The United States government released the voice intercept, uh, captured by the Japanese government, intercepted, of the Soviet pilot saying, I am shooting with my 50 caliber machine gun four rounds at that target. We released it to the UN, played it in front of the world. I know, because I was the guy at NSA that received that intercept tape and arranged for delivery to the White House. So our government is known when it's important to go ahead and release classified information to prove our veracity. If this is true, these claims of hack, it wouldn't be a big deal to release that evidence in today's world. It just wouldn't. Uh, also, the, those are the two items I also brought up as justification for them to proceed to do that kind of thing with the, the director Pompeo when I met with him. And uh, you know, he, he said, but it's classified. And I, I used those extreme, same two examples and said, that here's your clear precedent, plus Executive Order 13526, Section 1.7, uh, under the regulations of the federal government, the governing classification for the entire U.S. Army, uh, government, uh, it says you cannot classify, maintain classified, or not declassify any evidence of a crime, corruption, fraud, waste, and abuse. So I said, you already had the regulations to do it. Yeah, let's go to the audience and see if there's any questions. There's somebody in the back there. Get a microphone there. Um, 
first of all, thank you for um, you know, your honesty and uh, revealing all these uh, crimes to us. My question to all of you is, what do the American people have to do to arrest these criminals who are responsible for these acts, which I can only describe as administrative terrorism against you and other people of integrity? Is this on? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, as I, as I said it when I spoke, that this is an extremely rare <coughs> moment in history. And on that issue, you have a president and an attorney general and an appointed investigator, Durham, who are in fact committed to doing exactly that. This has never happened at this level. I mean, you could talk about Watergate or something, but this is this is nothing like that. We're we're looking at the complete capture of the American intelligence community by basically by British intelligence people coming out of MI6 and GCHQ who have captured the U.S. economy over these last 30 or 40 years uh, and basically transformed our economy into one rather than being on the American system where the, uh, where the financial system is controlled by elected officials and direct credit into the real economy for the betterment of the population and instead into so-called free market, free free trade policies, British policies, which allow banking institutions to run our economy and make decisions about where credit goes and what gets financed. And what ends up getting financed is bailing out banks rather than building the economy. And this is just as true in the intelligence community, that you have uh, the capture by British intelligence methods uh, over this period of time. Uh, which are now finally, for the, really the first time at a public level like this. And there's always been people who investigate and find these kinds of crimes, and certainly you know, these are some of the best. Uh, but now you have people at the level of the president investigating the crimes of the CIA, of the FBI, of the NSA. Uh, and there's every reason to be optimistic that this is going to be more than just finding people who committed crimes and putting them in prison where they belong. People like Comey and Strzok and, and, uh, and, and Brennan and Clapper and so forth, because they do belong in prison. Keep in mind that Roger, Roger Stone was just convicted uh, for three years and four months for lying to investigators. Look, I mean, Clapper lied to the Congress and to the American people about exactly this program. You know, I mean, these are... These people have lied so much that it becomes accepted because it's a whole different view of the world which people have been induced to accept. Well, that's what can be blown apart. And again, I would, I would say that the LaRouche intelligence operations, our executive intelligence review and so forth, are the crucial ingredient here which can bring this about in part by bringing the American population and around the world to understand what's really going on, because the media is certainly not going to tell you what Barr is really doing, you know that. So it depends on having this kind of capacity to convey to the population of the nation and the world what is behind what you're reading in the press, and to make that possible by bringing about the actual activity of the American population and the world population in support of what can and should be done and is being attempted to be done by Trump in some cases, and now by, by, by Barr and Durham. Uh, you know, I want to actually also, uh, myself, as my other colleague, uh, there's another question. I, actually, this is in part been answered, Bill, but this is for you. Uh, it would be tremendously helpful if we could get Benny to explain how this, meaning I think the Russian hack, can't be a copy of a copy ergo a file copied locally to a local USB drive. As you just said that it is that. Yes. Uh, getting this, okay, his answer would move a major shroud. But I think he's also asking, how do we know if you're saying that? Why does that mean, or does that mean, that Russia was not involved? Uh, well, if he's saying that the uh, people in the DNC uh, attached to the DNC network doing the download, were they Russian? Uh, I don't think that they would allow a Russian to access their network, but if they did, it could be a Russian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Got the answer. Very good. 
So another question out there. If I'm not seeing you, don't worry. I can't quite. There's somebody there. Um, thank you all for, for what you've said. Um, Mike, thank you. I'm always moved when I hear you speak. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, thanks again, Mike. I'm always moved when I hear you speak. Um, on this question that you raised uh, about um, the evil in our government, I'm, I'm very convinced that that is true. Um, some people might not agree with me, but I'm convinced that uh, an evil force within our government um, carried out a false flag attack on 9/11, and it was basically an inside job, and and um, and that there's a lot of evidence that has come out over the past years through declassifications of the involvement of um, high-level members of the Saudi government who, you know, were directly involved in in launching that attack, funding the, the hijackers, and so forth. And, in my opinion, they were just doing some of the legwork that the plot originated with these evil forces in our government. That's my opinion. But I, but um, it seems to me that um, what uh, that re revealing the truth of 9/11 would be one of the only things that is powerful enough to to purge our government of this evil force. And I don't know if uh, even getting to the bottom of the, the Russia Gate fraud would be powerful enough to do it. Um, and I think it complements very, very much the exoneration of, of Lyndon LaRouche, uh, as it is, ironically, uh, the guy who was head of FBI, Robert Mueller at the time, uh, who he was, he was head of FBI at the time of 9-11, and he was the main man who made sure that the truth of 9-11 didn't come out. He ironically was the lead prosecutor against Lyndon LaRouche in, in the 1980s and also and the thing against Trump. So anyway, I, I would just like uh, to hear from all of you and whether you think I'm right on, or whether you think my instincts are right on that. If, if, is it true that it's not really, we don't really have hope unless we can get the truth about 9-11 out? And, and if we do, there is hope for this country, but, but if we don't, then, then I don't know if anything else would, would really work. Well, I, I for one, uh, am, am quite aware of all of the evidence that's basically available publicly uh, that, uh, that has never been addressed by NIST or anybody else when, when they, uh, in any of the reports they did about 9-11. And certainly those are things that uh, would, would suggest that it was not just airplanes that, did, that caused the problem. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, um, you know, uh, the engin I'm the uh, engineers and scientists uh, uh, for 9-11 that had that petition to reinvestigate. I signed up to that years ago because it's obvious that, uh, that uh, our government did not do a proper job in that investigation. Uh, and that certainly we were not being told the truth. And certainly from the NSA side, we knew that there was a flight of, uh, of uh, Saudis that were allowed to leave the U.S. even after the uh, uh, shutdown of air travel. Uh, so that uh, there was a lot of other things going on that uh, Tom Drake knew about in NSA that said there was other evidence and things of that, that there were other planes that were supposedly uh, involved and so on. So uh, there was a lot left to be uh, explained. And in this, certainly when they went through and did, did their supposed study, certainly didn't explain a lot of the things like molten metal coming out of the buildings or, you know, a lot of how it, the building 7 fell almost on its footprint and all of those kinds of things that were visible, uh, plus some other uh, testimony from uh, fire and fire people involved, uh, you know, people from the fire department testifying, hearing explosions before well, the, the building seven fell. Things of all, uh, things of that nature that should have been addressed in any competent investigation by a government. You know, we're not, and that, so therefore, there's something wrong here that needs to be followed up for sure. And that certainly would be one of the ones. I think the, the current Russia investigation is going to take you right into the coup attempt. And that's part of the other, the as other aspects that could also be, be enough to be justification to really address this in a major way. So yeah, both, both events in my, in my view would be, uh, would be justifications that would be use, useful and, and would also generate enough energy to, to do something. 
Can I add something there? Yeah, okay. There's there's another side to this too, which is generally not talked about even by the people who are going after the truth behind the Saudi rule and so forth, which is uh, that there is a very a very clear evidence historically on the way in which British intelligence created every Islamic radical movement from the beginning of this process, going back to the end of World War One, the creation of the Muslim Brotherhood by British intelligence. Uh, the creation of Al-Qaeda, I think most of you probably know that when the Russians went into Afghanistan, the British and the American intelligence gathered up radical Islamists from around the world, took them into Afghanistan, armed them. They made a movie here in America about the great congressman who helped these freedom fighters. This was Al-Qaeda who fought the Russians. Why were the Russians there? That's, a, that's a, another question. I won't go into that. But this was the creation of Islamic terrorism. The whole history of this demonstrates that the British always want to have a hand on both sides. And when they had nationalist governments growing up in the Arab world, people like Nasser, um, uh, people in Iran, like, like Mossadegh in Iran, yes. they would create the Khomeini movement, for instance, the Muslim Brotherhood yes. in Egypt against Nasser, in order to make it impossible for other nations to come together around their actual self-interests, like the Arab nations who were trying to create some sort of an Arab unity around a development <coughs> process. This was broken. Just the more recent case of the so-called uh, Arab Spring, totally British intelligence <coughs> run from the top to the bottom. Morsi in Egypt, straight British intelligence asset within the Muslim Brotherhood. So th what happened here, I mean, there. Clearly, the Al-Qaeda apparatus in the 9-11 case, Lynn was actually on the radio in Utah the morning that happened, and his first response was, they're going to try to say Khomeini did it. No. Uh, I, mean, I mean, Osama bin Laden did it. They're going to say Osama did it in some cave in Afghanistan. Bull. He said, that was his immediate response. Uh, but nonetheless, these are the networks that are used by the operatives who are running this. This is the way British intelligence works. So those networks out of Afghanistan from what became Al-Qaeda were the tools used by those whose purpose, as Lynn had defined before it happened, when Bush was elected, Lynn said there is going to be a Reichstag fire. There's going to be an event, probably in Washington, uh, which will justify George Bush and his crew, Cheney, implementing police state measures, what became known as the Patriot Act. It happened. Now, do we know all the details of how this thing was run? We still don't. It still has to be investigated. But we know why and how and who the actual authors of this are. I want to uh, ask Kirk to respond and take this to a different level. Because uh, many of you, if you were here when we had a showing of A Good American, which was back in November 2017, the, the movie that, which features Bill, and Kirk is there as well. Uh, you may remember that the discussion of Thin Thread indicated that, and this is what Diane Rourke actually states in the, in the film, uh, that had that system been implemented as it could have been prior to 9-11, that that action could not have occurred. And I'd like, Kirk, maybe you could start us off on that as to say, first of all, why that was the case. and. Uh, what that means. Because in other words, let's suppose we don't know exactly who in British intelligence did it, who, do, who were the Saudis and the this and the that. Suppose you didn't even have the inkling of, that, of a particular, you don't know anything about British history. So you don't know the British intelligence has been doing this for 45, 50 years beforehand. Longer. Suppose you didn't know any of that. <laughs> suppose you didn't know any of that. Would it have been possible for that attack to have been prevented? So could you yeah, uh, let me first say from a technology point of view, Al-Qaeda did nothing, absolutely nothing, that was difficult for us. They used normal communications lines, commercial, a lot of telephone. Now, one of our own U.S. senators blew it when he divulged the fact that Osama bin Laden was using a satellite phone. And that was Orrin Hatch of Utah. 
and it was excused. You know, if it were me or Bill, we would have been thrown in jail. Uh, but the point of it is, they did nothing, quote, sexy or difficult. We were well on to them and what they were doing. Now, you may remember footage where the former director of NSA, not Hayden, but the uh, Alexander, General Alexander, Major General U.S. Army, got, was testifying or answering a question, uh, and he said, oh no, this was difficult because uh, the, the, the phone company system, and, let me tell you, <laughs> what a bunch of bull dookie. I will keep it polite. Bull dookie. That was. It was absolutely false. So I see no reason why the, the key communications uh, couldn't have uh, divulged uh, the planning for this operation. Now I will tell you another story. Uh, another, I'll give you a tidbit because I want to work and Bill does too with the organization here in New York that's legally looking into the entire 9-11 operation. Um, we're going to be talking to some lawyers and helping that, that effort. Um, there's information that I've been given that there was a small analytic group within the National Security Agency that knew about the oncoming attack before it happened. Already knew it independent of thin thread. And that doesn't surprise me. I told you, they didn't do anything out of the ordinary. We already understood basic communications at NSA and had cooperation from phone companies and things of that nature. Uh, but, but this small cell was ordered by the director of NSA not to report the information. That is the question, the real question. Why would you have allowed that attack to happen? Why? And we won't know till we get the truth. And I swear to you, we owe the victims and their families the nothing short of that truth. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure it gets. I just wanted to add one little tidbit to that so you better understand what the process is here uh, and how stupid it is what they did. Uh, Alexander was testifying, you know, that, uh, you know, under the minimization program that uh, when the call came between the, some of the terrorists in San Diego, California, uh, to uh, their uh, uh, center in uh, Yemen, uh, the, the Al-Qaeda terrorist center in Yemen, uh, that was well known. Uh, because we knew the entire Al Qaeda network by 1996, based on this Inmarnet, Inmarsat phone that uh, that uh, uh, Osama bin Laden was using, we knew the phone number. We just followed all his calls and reconstructed the entire network worldwide. So we knew them all. So this guy is coming in from Kuala Lumpur, known people. They were known to be Al Qaeda, and they came into uh, San Diego and then made calls to uh, this Yemen terrorist facility in uh, yeah, for Al Qaeda. And checking in, you know. So uh, he was saying Alexander was testifying. Well, we couldn't tell it where it was, uh, you know, because uh, of our minimization process. Well, minimization process only occurs when an analyst makes a pull of data out of the database. In the database is all the data, or in the collection database, it's called. That is it is there. And what when it minimizes, it simply blanks it out. So when it pulls out, and you have terrorist center calls blank. What that tells you immediately, they're calling somebody in the U.S., you know? So you immediately go to the collection database, get the number out of the collection database, and that's who they called in the U.S. And then you give it to the FBI, and they go down and target them. Nobody did that. Isn't, uh, along that line, isn't it interesting that NSA couldn't fit, claimed, Alexander claimed, they couldn't tell the connection between whom and whom but the telephone company has no problem giving them a bill every month. <laughs> I, 
I would, I would also, I would also point out that's how caller ID works. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you very much for coming today. It's an honor to be in your presence. Um, I was a big fan of Phil Haney, and um, he was the founding member of uh, Homeland Security, and he was recently found dead. And I was just wondering, with his important work on tracking terrorists, and with his, um, you know, being forced into trying to uh, remove the data, you know, so it couldn't be traced. I was wondering if you just had anything to say about his passing. Uh, I think uh, that uh, it was not uh, suicide. That's my impression. I mean, I just don't think that the conditions were right and all. I think they're reevaluating that now. Yeah, it's investigated. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that that should be pursued. You know, as not as a as, as a murder, basically. Uh, I can't see, so you got questions over there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. We're going to alternate between the two sides, because I'm sorry. Hello. Um, I am wondering if you guys, from a technological perspective, know anything about Indira Singh and her research and activism into P-TECH, and if its relationship to 9-11 and the Saudi government? Who's the person? Indira Singh. She used to um, do risk management for J.P. Morgan Chase, and she turned activist. Um, when she met with people from P Tech, um, who she believes um, were they, it's related to the Danny Casalero investigation, um, who was by activists on, I guess, the internet. Um, Point, they believed he was suicided for his investigation into technology that was stolen by a private company by the U.S. government and backdoored. Um, she made the relationship between that uh, technology and this P-Tech company now owned by the Saudis, um, which the Canadians have looked into too. It's like essentially this P-Tech um, software has been implemented into high uh, government agencies, private organizations all across you know, the U.S. and international. Just wondering if you guys have ever heard of it? Know anything about it? I have not. It was called Promise. The yes, Promise, Promise Technology. Oh, Promise. Yes. Yeah. It's the yeah. Justice yeah. Department. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, I do know about Promise. Yeah, I, Bill Bill Hamilton. I, we've exchanged uh, information with Bill. Yeah, that's uh, what happened. Is Bill trusted the government and they stole his uh, yes. they stole his intellectual property, and he won a lawsuit and they hadn't paid him anything since that lawsuit is won. So, okay, I, I know about that. That's why that's why I, I never wrote down any of the intellectual capital we had. So so the government could never get it. Yeah, it? so Indira Singh um, has come out, she's done an interview with James Corbett from CorbettReport.com, um, has done a whole interview with her about linking the promise has now, she believes, become P-TECH, which is in, owned by the Saudi government. And the FAA uses it, the IBM uses it, all, all of this technology that apparently had this back door. I think probably the best thing is for us to just talk about it, investigate it, and get back to you about it. By the way, I should also just say there are several people that are writing text questions, and we'll forward those on, on, uh, on if we don't have a chance to answer them all. Uh, but, uh, on. Uh, here. Where are you? Well, there's a lot of questions. Okay, we're going to do as many of these as we Thank can. You. Um, I certainly hope it's true that this is a moment for uh, openness and the possibility of penetrating these layers of secrecy and discovering um, discovering what needs to be discovered. I wonder if your gentleman could comment on the uh, change in the rules uh, for the use of nuclear weapons. As I recall, there was a conference in 2006, comprising uh, top officials in the, the Pentagon 
and uh, representatives of the arms uh, corporations. Uh, and under that uh, uh, new policy, uh, if the president determines that a region of the world is uh, c comprises a, a serious uh, strategic threat, he can delegate the decision to use nuclear weapons to the regional commander. Uh, am, I, am I correct in uh, summarizing that conference and what, what perspective do you have on that? No, I just know what the prompt goal of this right program, which was approximately the same time. I don't know if we were. Let me put it this way. From the time, let's just do this, from the time of the uh, active uh, pursuit of the doctrine of preventive war, which occurred with Iraq, uh, the 2003 in, uh, invasion, uh, that was a foot in the door to the uh, revision of what had been the standing nuclear policy of the United States of mutual assured destruction. Uh, to a policy of first use, prompt global strike, which uh, was something that began to be essentially discussed, but was already being implemented by the letter in 2006, uh, was a way of introducing that policy. Um, and yes, the New York Times and others have leaked articles to that effect. In fact, you may remember there was a bit of a, of a, of a, of a row between Donald Trump and the New York Times about this question as to whether or not powers to launch nuclear war could in fact be divested from the president and invested in other areas of government. All of this stuff is a way of trying to shift to something that many of us cut our teeth on. I know that a lot of people here are sitting and some of you are here and wondering all about, you know, the, the, uh, the Lyndon LaRouche connection. What you want to realize is that, or know, is that from 1981, through 1983, Lyndon LaRouche engaged in a back-channel discussion with the Soviet Union on the question of nuclear technologies and nuclear weapons. Again, it was something that was vetted through the National Security Council. Uh, it was something that was, uh, the coordinating person was Judge Clark of the National Security Council. Uh, these discussions went on here in New York and they went on also in Washington, D.C. Now, the conception of the discussions was to replace mutual and assured destruction with mutual and assured survival. And this involved what people knew popularly as what was called Star Wars technology, but was, it was directed energy beam technology that was being uh, developed by both the Soviet Union and the United States at the time. What happened was that LaRouche proposed a policy that was discussed with the Russians, which the Russians believed he had no possibility of actually implementing through the United States government whatsoever. That fact that LaRouche was doing was trying to profile the Soviet Union. And uh, they rejected the policy. And they, the, the, the negotiators were very nice about it, but the truth of the matter was that a drop-off refused it. And when Ronald Reagan announced the policy on March 23, 1983, <coughs> the Soviets were completely caught flat-footed, as, by the way, were most of the people in the Department of Defense in the United States. Uh, uh, firstly, no one understood the policy at the time that it occurred because nobody believed that something could be done, which was to talk to the President of the United States about it. The President could announce the policy. Um, we, uh, there, there were elements of our organization that were involved in the writing of elements of Reagan's speech. Uh, and what happened was that that became policy. I'm saying that because what's important to recognize is that the notions of beam defense and beam technologies and space technologies and all these things were things that were being discussed extensively all during the early 1980s. Uh, and you can find, by the way, a clip of Donald Trump discussing it in 1999 with Wolf Blitzer. It's a four and a half minute discussion in which he talks about something called a defense shield. And he references Reagan's earlier discussions about this which people ridiculed, and now the technology is available. I'm only referencing this because the reason that I think it's important, just your question is relevant, I'll just summarize here. I realize that it must be very difficult for many people here, and it's not a matter of being in any sense condescending whatsoever, because the world has become damn confusing. There are no divisions of the type that you've been led to believe. There's no divisions in left and right. There are no divisions in the parties in the United States. You're in a situation which is much different. 
uh, it's very much sort of like what you people probably refer, refer to as the matrix of the 1990s. But that's not that useful a reference because it's really a lot different. And there are forces, there are ways, there are means that we can all as Americans join together right now. We have to access the idea in our country that we are really involved in something that's pretty dangerous, including potential thermonuclear war right now. But it's also together with viruses, it's also together with collapse of the economy, it's together with a lot of things. It's a conjunctural crisis. It's not one element. And so I just will say this to you. There is right now, yes, a policy in the United States that nuclear weapons can be used first. But it's also the case that in Russia, uh, there have been deployment of weapons which are beyond, in certain respects, present deployed American capabilities. And that has acted as, a, acted as a deterrent. The President of the United States is aware of this. Vladimir Putin announced it on March 1st of 2018. Just go back and look at the speech that day and see it. And therefore, negotiations among the various countries are really critical. China, Russia, India, the United States. Um, so I just wanted to take that much and just let people know the reason we are saying this to you around the figure of Vladimir Lerushin, around the cases of all these people who have been raided by the FBI, every single person up here, with the exception of myself. I was just an unindicted co-conspirator in one of the cases, so I'm, I'm junior here. <laughs> but um, the reason we're bringing this to your attention is because something can now be done. So I, I, I thank you for the question. Uh, we should, let me have a brief. I want to remind people of what Helga Zepp-Larouche said in her uh, take saying this morning. This is, she reported that yesterday General Walters, the U.S. Europe commander, uh, was asked in a Senate hearing, a Senator House, I forget which, uh, what, what is your opinion on no first use of nuclear weapons, which was at least accepted under the Mutual Assured Destruction Doctrine. We wouldn't start a war because we could blow each other up. At least it was accepted that there's no first use. And Walter's response, I mean, this is astonishing. This is a top U.S. military general who said, my view is flexible use. I am in a position to decide whether I may or may not use nuclear weapons. First, this is, this is real. This is very dangerous. And then secondly, briefly, just to, again on the LaRouche connection, when, uh, when Reagan adopted the SDI, everybody knew this was LaRouche's doctrine. In fact, when they called the White House and said, what, what is this, what is this? They said, call, call the Fusion Energy Foundation, which is our organization. And Paul Gallagher, who was head of it at the time, was the person interviewed on the, on the media about what this is, because we knew, because we wrote it. Lynn, Lynn's idea, we had organized all over the world for years for this idea, and we got it into the president, and he recognized it, and he adopted it. When they were, the people around Reagan who were from the so-called neocon crowd, Schultz and people like this, were trying to get him to give it up. And they had all kinds of means. Uh, one way was that they arranged for a, a, lead, a major arms control meeting between Reagan and Gorbachev, which took place in Reykjavik. That took place in October of 1986. And they wanted to basically con Reagan into giving up the SDI in exchange for the Russians agreeing to certain kind of limitations. While that meeting was going on, the, all the journalists gathered there were watching the television films of Mr. LaRouche's house being surrounded, himself being let off in chains. The raid on our office was the news story around the world on CNN that weekend. And this was supposed to contribute to getting Reagan to give up this crazy idea of this lunatic LaRouche. Uh, he didn't. He didn't give it up. And as a result, there was no arms deal at that point. But he refused to give up the SDI. So this, there's more to say on all of that. But I mean, this is, this is all of a piece. Everything we've been going over is, is of a single piece, which has now come right down to the deciding moment where it's going to go one way or the other. Let me go to one question, which we had this text. This is to you, Bill. Another question that came in is, Vinny meeting with Pompeo. What was conveyed and what was relayed to the president? Uh, as far as I know, uh, nothing. <laughs> I, I just don't know. Nobody's told me uh, what has been relayed at all. Okay. Very clear. 
There's a lot of people down here, by the way, that have had their hands up for a long time. So, yeah. Okay, the mic is on. Yes. Hi. Uh, Let me uh, uh, raise right. this. I've got a question for, uh, actually, for, for, for Bill. You know, you, you've described very adequately uh, why there was no internet transmission to Russia or any other place that only a flash drive, thumb drive could handle the data transfer speeds necessarily. But after that, there are a couple of other steps. Julian Assange ends up getting this and then releasing it to the world. Now, Julian Assange has been very, very assiduously steadfast in never, ever revealing the source of his information to protect them. Uh, I happen to uh, have seen a Dutch language newscast where he let something slip. And what he slipped is that it was from someone close to the Democrat National Committee. It wasn't broadcast here. And then all of a sudden, one of the young staffers, a guy by the name of Seth Rich, ends up dead in the streets in Washington, D.C. at four in the morning, with his wallet intact, but no flash drive. Various people have said he was going to meet someone with the FBI and give them the drive. Unfortunately, the FBI was not apparently informed that Assange already had gotten the data. So there's no investigation on this dead kid. His parents are, are, are mortified, terrified, and don't want to talk about it. Probably because they figure what happened to their son could happen to them too. Uh, do you have any reaction to it from this chain of custody that must have happened for Assange to get it? Now, one more point. Assange offered a $20,000 reward for information for anything to do with the death of Seth Rich. He has never done that with anybody else. None of his sources of information have ever been graced by an award. Of course, some of them are, most of them are still alive. But uh, if, if there's a smoking gun, uh, I can smell the smoke. Yeah, I, 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 a couple more points to add to the, the things that you raised. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, Julian Assange has uh, publicly said he did not receive this data from a state actor, certainly not. He didn't receive it from the Russians or any other state actor. He made that very clear. Uh, and Kim.com is also publicly on the web saying that he assisted Seth Rich in getting the data to the WikiLeaks. Now, he's, he's a member of the WikiLeaks organization, I believe, and uh, so <coughs> you know, that's another fact. But also Craig Murray, the former uh, ambassador to Uzbekistan, I believe, British ambassador to Uzbekistan, said that he, when he was visiting the United States in Washington, he met somebody on the campus of American University who assisted in that transfer of information. He didn't receive it in thumb drive from him, but he did assisted that he said this person they met assisted transferring data to WikiLeaks from the DNC. So uh, there's those facts, plus uh, the Cy Hirsch's uh, <clears throat> uh, illegally recorded statements made uh, from his FBI source that said the FBI has a report on the Seth Rich computer. Uh, this is all of what he said. It's publicly available. If you go on the web, you can listen to it. And he said the FBI knew that from the computer they could see he had contacts with WikiLeaks. He was asking for money for WikiLeaks and so on. So <clears throat> that's, uh, that's hearsay statements so far, but and not factual evidence that's admissible in the court of law. Um, unless you can find, I mean, the president should be ordering up this FBI report. He can easily do that. It's not a problem with him. I mean, he, is, he can be classified if he wants to, which he should. So, you know, uh, certainly there's a lot more to it than uh, what I've said earlier. I mean, I just said the forensics part of it uh, earlier. This is the backup statements from people involved in various aspects of it. 
side. I, uh, I'd just like to put this in context. Um, so I grew up in the 80s during the Cold War. I was three years old. I had a reoccurring dream. I was in the waters. This, the, the, the horizon was burning. There were Russian subs and sharks in the water. And I was so petrified not to go into this Russian sub. I'd rather either stay in the water and be eaten by a shark or go to that burning shoreline. So it's, it's okay to laugh. Uh, so today, I, I, I'd like to put this in the context of the other individual who was asking about 9-11, right, and people growing up with this kind of stuff. I was three years old, and I hate the Russians, right? I don't anymore, obviously. Uh, and then we have this impeachment of Trump and these massive cover-ups going on. Uh, and then the last thing uh, that comes to my mind is Nancy Pelosi sitting there behind Trump tearing up the speech. So we have these things that these young people are growing up with, uh, I would like to if you comment on how to um, put it in context for maybe the younger generation. And also, I know somebody on the stage can tell us why we need cathartic events uh, like this. Thank you. Since you mentioned Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> uh, I, I find it that, you know, I, I listened to her the other day, have to, we have to stand up and defend the Constitution. Well, you see, uh, what a lot of people don't know is that there were four people breaked into all the criminal programs at NSA and CIA in November of 2001. They were the chair and ranking members of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. That's the, on the House side, that was Porter Goss and Nancy Pelosi. And on the Senate side, I think it was uh, Shelby and Graham. Uh, so those people were the first four that's how you co-opt in Congress. You get the leadership to pre first get involved and, and accept it, which they did, by the way. They accepted these unconstitutional programs. So, so much for standing up for the Constitution. But the point is that once they got accepted them, they were now co-opted in and now had to defend the administration's approach on all these programs. That's why Nancy Pelosi, when she became Speaker of the House, said impeaching George Bush is off the table because she's already co-opted in to the programs. And if, they, if they, she was going to allow the impeachment of George Bush, George would say, hey, you have to, you have to impeach yourself, too. Because you're a part of this. So, at any rate, I, I just had to say that about Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> and, and I would add, um, if you do some reading into our history uh, in Congress, what you've seen in this standoff between factions and what I would call incivility, rudeness, disrespect, is mild there in our history. There was a time when fistfights actually broke out on the floor of the Senate. So in our history, which I know they don't teach much anymore, um, this is really nothing new. I think the underlying issues that have been mentioned and spoken about here are the elephants in the room. Don't worry about these little snits and things. Uh, we'll get past those. But the deeper issues and the connectivity between groups and forces are the real thing to keep the eyeball on. Yeah. The other thing I would add, if I may, um, you grew up in the 80s. I mean, this, this is important. We have had a cultural degradation in the United States. I want to come back to this cultural issue. You know, people who grew up in the 50s and 60s, especially in the 60s with Kennedy and the space program, they were given something to, to inspire them to the idea that they have a future, and that future is involved with science and technology and mastering the universe and bringing dominion over nature. That whole idea, which is it's a Christian idea, it's also a Confucian idea, but this, this concept that each and every individual has, has a role in transforming the universe was really at the very core of the American idea. It was completely destroyed over these last 50 years with the uh, inundation of drugs, with the inundation of, of ugly music, called music, noise, with the basic destruction of the ability of our children to learn classical music when they're growing up, which is almost non-existent in our school system, with video games that are nothing but violence and sex and pornography. We, the culture has been destroyed. You have these cathartic events, which are accepted 
or terrorize you into sinking into this fantasy world that most people live in, especially most of our, our younger generations, who've been given no sense of a future. Now again, this is a rare moment. Uh, Trump hasn't done everything he, we want him to do, but he did go with Artemis. He said, we're going to go to the moon, back to the moon, we're going to go to Mars. Uh, he did say this drug stuff is ridiculous. He did say this entire climate change hysteria and fear that we have to shut down the world in order to save the universe is pure bunk. This is giving people a sense, at least, of the kinds of ideas that we've been fighting for for the last 50 years, and which finally is at least before the population. Uh, and again, why it's so essential that we fight for the exoneration of Lynn and for all of these ideas to be put on the table so that people can stop being afraid of the power of beautiful ideas. Hi, thank you very, very much. My name is Sue Peters, and I'm a member of the American Monetary Institute, and we study the history of the banking system. Our banking system originally came from England, so <laughs> along with the security forces. And um, I just want to say, uh, what we always say is, uh, President Eisenhower warned us of the military-industrial complex, but he left out the financial military-industrial complex. And I want to applaud the LaRouche people and um, the, uh, I forget her name, Elga? Helga. 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 Helga for saying the solution of we have to go and change the monetary system. But I just want to say, with studying the history of this, as this is a solution, yes, but Helga is talking about going back to Bretton Woods in 1944. That does not take away from these private commercial banks the power they have to create the money. If we don't take away the power from the private commercial banks to create it, they'll just buy everything back. And I just want to say to the audience, it's the thing that's very hard because our history has been taken away. Very hard to understand, but people in the 1800s understood it. <coughs> private commercial banks, whenever they make a loan, they do not take money from one account and give it to the borrower. That's not their legal power. Their legal power from day one in this country is they have the legal right to create the deposit in the borrower's account when the loan is made. And that power funds all of this. And we have to take that power away from them if we're going to solve this problem. Thank you. The, the issue of, of, of banks issuing credit is something that's different from the fundamental difference between the American system and the British system. The American system was explicitly not a monetary system. What Hamilton devised was a means whereby the purpose of the government is credit, not money. And there's a huge difference. Lynn always used to say, money is stupid. It doesn't know anything. You can use money to build a steel mill or a whorehouse. Uh, but credit has a mind. Credit has the idea of a future that is going to be used in order to create something in the future. And, and LaRouche always said that his forecasting capacity was not a matter of crystal ball gazing on what's going to happen, but how do you create what's going to happen. And it's this concept of credit and a creditary system which we've completely lost, completely gone. When with the Federal Reserve, which is itself not uh, a, a national bank, the way we had a creditary system was through a national bank, a Hamiltonian bank, where the government ran the bank on behalf of the people. The elected officials ran the direction of credit into those things needed for the general welfare, for infrastructure, for, for roads and power and education and health. That was the American system. Then we were told, oh no, the independence of the Fed, free market, free trade, Adam Smith, who was the enemy of America. But we have to follow this system. This is free market, free trade. This is capitalism. Well, that's nonsense. The word capitalism is itself virtually meaningless. 
And the, the distinction to be made in economy is that between the original American system and the British system, which is banking dictatorship over government and, and over empire, which of course is the core of the British, uh, and which continues even though the, um, it, the owning of colonies doesn't exist anymore through the IMF and the World Bank and the City of London. And what they're doing today, and in fact it just happened yesterday, is in the City of London planning how they can use this climate change hoax to justify cutting off credit to any industry which produces carbon, i.e. any industry. <laughs> it's, a, it's a myth to justify a policy of completely breaking the physical economy and the population of the human race under the guise of protecting our planet. So the issue here is credit versus money. There's a huge difference. It's something not learned in America anymore because our schools don't teach the American system. Uh, and this is, again, one of the tasks that we've taken on, that Arush took on himself personally, to make sure that we make this known to the world. Yes, uh, right now, there's a very important trial going on in the federal courts in New York. There's a uh, Joshua Schulte, S-C-H-U-L-T-E, is being tried under the Espionage Act. He is an associate of WikiLeaks, or at least alleged associate of WikiLeaks, and uh, He's uh, on trial under the Espionage Act, which is the same act that the uh, Rosenbergs were on trial for, the same act that uh, uh, Julian Assange is being said to be targeted by. And it's one where you face life imprisonment or even capital punishment. And nobody knows that this trial, I shouldn't say nobody, because if you read every square inch of the New York Times, it was mentioned once or twice. But otherwise, it's almost completely secret, but the entire media just doesn't notice it at all. And this has been going on now for weeks. Actually, the trial now is in the stage of the closing uh, statements. The defense has rested its case. And what the defendant is accused of leaking is information about a section of the CIA that was created, Vault 5, to specialize in hacking people's computers, uh, namely that of dissidents, people that are uh, uh, doing independent research, and so on. And uh, it even said in one of the articles uh, that Vault 5 would leave telltale signs that would connect uh, whatever, whatever information was found with some con uh, phony connection with intelligence services of other governments and, and so on. And uh, this seems to also be uh, possibly the warm-up to the Julian Assange trial if that manages to take place. So. Uh, I'm just wondering if anyone on the panel has uh, uh, more um, information about this. And also, I personally would like to uh, urge people to uh, go to the federal court uh, building at 500 Pearl Street, and uh, I believe it's on the 14th floor of that building, and uh, show some solidarity with the person who's under another obvious frame-up for trying to get useful information out to the people that the media completely suppresses, including this gigantic uh, trial that's going on right now. Could I guess, actually, you said Vault 5. Did you mean Vault 7? Uh, uh, maybe I got that one wrong. Okay, don't worry about it. Fine. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, 
Well, I mean, uh, I think this is the fellow who was involved, a contractor working for CIA that took the Vault 7 material out and supposedly gave it, leak, allegedly gave it to the WikiLeaks. These, these are the allegations against them in the court, is that correct, I think? Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, I, again, uh, it's not a question of a... In, in terms of the uh, Espionage Act, if they want to really uh, apply it, they have to show a state that, uh, that they're doing the dyspore. In other words, they're, what they're alle with, uh, with uh, Julian Assange, what they're search basically wanting to do is shut him down. We don't want the truth being told by anybody. Even though it's truth the crimes we are committing, you know? So, and I get back to Executive Order 13526, Section 1.7, they cannot classify that material. They must declassify it according to the regulations. Anything that's evidence of a crime must be, de must be declassified. You can't hide behind crimes behind classification. That's what that article basically says. So, uh, and I don't think that, uh, I don't think that anybody involved uh, in this court case even made an argument in that case for that. Uh, executive order being applied because that's the order governing all classification that should take away this idea of classification in terms of uh, because Vault 7 shows all the criminal acts that they're capable of performing against everybody in the world and yet, and yet they have not and, and when it came to cybersecurity this the swindle number two I call it swindle one was you gave up you had to give up privacy for security so you, we will charge you a hundred billion a year for that and then the next thing was cybersecurity. Uh, you, you know, the whole idea was there were hundreds of millions of lines of source code in Vault 7, and they boiled down to tens of thousands of, of attacks on operating systems, firewalls, you know, private networks, uh, servers, switches, everything in the world that, that allowed them to penetrate and, and read and see what you were doing and saying to others and all, and what others were saying to you. So. It was so they, they, they wanted their window open so they could see what you were doing at the expense of making you all vulnerable. So every time they get an attack, they come around and say, we need more money for cybersecurity. And I say that we shouldn't give them a dime, because it's swindle number two, is because they already knew what the errors were. They didn't fix them, so we were sitting here open and exposed and vulnerable. So if you don't fix the problems you know about, why should we give you more money to fix problems you aren't going to fix anyway? So, you know, it's a fix the problems you know, then we'll have, maybe we'll have some security, then if you get attacked, sure, then you need more money. Until then, no. Hi, uh, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for your uh, service, your sacrifice, and your bravery. And, uh, countries have that capability and uh, I know we uh, the intelligence community we all work together friend, you know friendly intelligence communities um, do other countries spy on Americans uh, on behalf of the American government I think the short answer is yes <laughs> But uh, actually, uh, other countries don't have the capacity to build all these major storage facilities that, because it costs a lot of money to do that. And the British, for example, when they're tapping the transatlantic cables through the point in view, view to England, down at the far lower right uh, or left side of the east, west, far west portion of England, the major cable lines across the Atlantic surface there, and so they tap them there. We, I think, our government gave them $250 million to set up that tapping point. Uh, that's because they don't have the money to do it, but we do. Um, we borrow it, make it, or, you know, take you know, take it from China or something, you know. Let's add it to our debt, you know, hey. At any rate, uh, the, 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 uh, the whole idea is they still are dependent on us to store the data because they're taking in so much data coming in from the Five Eyes and nine other countries. And they use, uh, the Five Eyes use, and the, all the agencies of the U.S. government use the IC Reach program. It's on the web. If you went NSA program IC Reach, uh, you can actually read about it. So it's all on the web, mostly from Snowden's material. But that's how they query this database that's set up. That's, be, that's because NSA is doing storage facility for everybody. 
So, and the, the other countries that aren't uh, Five Eyes use a, a X key score, which is a separate a query program. It also limits access to that data set. But uh, uh, so they are, they use, that. also our embassies, I believe, use that, and uh, various other uh, organizations of the government across the world use the X key score as a way of getting in. But all of that data is uh, being stored by NSA. That's why I say, if you focus in on that, fix that, purge it, and then you have given privacy to everybody in the world for every country in the world because they're dependent on us to store the data. And, and to indirect answer to your question, do we have other countries spy on us? And the answer is yes, we do. And the answer why, to why, is because those countries don't have our laws. It's that simple. Okay, oh, we're going to go over here next. And while we're doing that, let me just say several people have sort of texted me about an issue, the issue of the coronavirus. I will phrase a question because there's some several uh, at some point uh, when we get a break. But obviously, there's a lot of people here who still have questions. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Daniel Burke, and I've been a, an activist with the LaRouche movement for about eight years. And I am an independent candidate for U.S. Senate in New Jersey. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to double down on the idea that we should be optimistic. I think that, um, you know, in terms of what I've been doing with my campaign, we went on January 28th to the President's Wildwood Rally, which was an incredible scene, enormous numbers of people in New Jersey. First time he had came to New Jersey. And we had 25 volunteers, and we had a big, beautiful banner, and a lot of thousands and thousands of copies of my statement calling for endorsing Al Belarus's call for a summit between Trump, Putin, and Xi Jinping. And in addition, we alerted the people who were there to the fact that Vladimir Putin put through his own proposal for a summit uh, on January 15th, about two weeks after Mrs. Larouche did. Uh, and people there really had no idea what we were talking about. It was not on their radar. And we brought it to their attention. We had a very good response out there. Uh, there's so much that we can do between these countries if we commit to eliminating the, the threat of these warmongers like Pompeo and actually creating the basis for mutual benefit. You know, I think that I, I, was, uh, I, I was in 10th grade when 9-11 happened and it shaped my whole experience of life. But I have a one-year-old daughter who Kirk and Bill got to, you know, they saw her last night. And she, when she's six years old, if this Artemis program is successful, she will see Americans walking on the moon. And I think that that's going to shape the way that she looks at humanity and looks at the universe. So there's a lot of things, a lot of reason to be optimistic and means by which these countries can cooperate. Therefore, my question to you, in context, I think, it, it looks like, as of this report from Reuters, it was actually reported by TOSS, that a high-level U.S. official has said that Trump wants to have this arms control meeting between the United States, Russia, China, France, and the U.K. It looks like we're headed in that direction. And we have about eight weeks until the uh, Elba day, which is the day that, uh, outside of the proposal of the P5 summit, Putin has proposed that invited many world leaders, including Trump, to come to Moscow on the 75th anniversary of the meeting of the U.S. and Soviet troops on the Elba. Uh, if I were in the position of the people who set up the people on that stage, I would be taking the next eight weeks to make the biggest, most nasty, you know, explosion of all types of things that I could possibly do to prevent that summit from working. And I'm calling on people here to actually take action in the near term to support that summit to actually take place and to put forward positive proposals to make that happen. And so my question is, what would you do if you could sit down and talk to President Trump? If we could break the containment represented not only by Pompeo on Bill's case, but also Dana Rohrabacher said that John Kelly uh, was the one he spoke to about a potential pardon for Assange, and then 
never has any idea whether or not President Trump heard that. If we can break that containment, what, what should we be talking about at that summit? Well, I think uh, I, I, would, uh, I would, of course, uh, advocate for that summit to the President and tell him that the best advice he can do is to ignore his staff. <laughs> And my question is about the presence of UC Global in the Ecuadorian Embassy in London where Assange sought asylum that we've learned about in recent revelations that was apparently live streaming, live streaming his every move directly to the CIA, including visits with his attorneys. Uh, I wonder if any of you could speak to that. In uh, 2015, I had the distinct honor of entering that embassy and sitting down uh, with several others and Julian Assange to whom we had brought two wonderful bottles of Australian wine. <laughs> and over the next, oh I'd say almost two hours, we had conversations about all the issues you can imagine. But I would tell you that right after we sat down and he had our attention, he quietly let us know there was monitoring. So he was aware of it. And I think he was careful to steer influence conversations that we had, and we were all astute enough to be tuned in to what he, he was trying to convey to us. So uh, we, were, we were certainly careful in what we said. But I'm not surprised at all. Hi, uh, my name is Rap, just because I'm recovering from a lot of. Um, so it's going to be careful. Anyway, um, I just want to say thank you to everyone. You're all very brave, and especially to Mike. Um, I bet even the, if there are spies in this room, they are, they are inspired by your story. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to add something um, about my love, and I did have a question. I will try and keep this quick. Um, I know that it's easy to ignore the issue or push it off, and I want to remind everyone why it's so important, because if it indeed was a false flag, then as soon as we start succeeding in making peace, um, then there can just be another false flag and the government can say, oh, you see, you know, there are terrorists, we can't, we can't, you know, make peace with these countries. Um, and I, I highly recommend to anyone who's interested in the topic to go to um, Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. They have a lot of really good information on the topic. Um, I'll be standing on the side because I'm trying to put a student group together and this is something that I, I do. Um, so if you're, inter if you're interested, um, and I also want to say that, um, you know, if you're struggling with trying to read about this and it's upsetting, um, or you want to just shove it away, I ask you to remember that uh, the truth is what it is, so we might as well try and figure out what the truth is. And, um, you know, ignoring the topic won't, won't make it go away. So um, my question is, what would you do if you were threatened or asked to um, be quiet, and uh, do you have any fears about um, being a target of assassination, or are there any protections that you, precautions that you take? And so well, I, let me tell you about my friend here. Uh, right after we were raided, he looked at me and he said, I don't commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, for a while, we were honestly frightened by the fact that armed people had come into our homes and essentially, you know, trapped us in the prison of our home for some seven hours while they looked at, through everything. Um, they said, think of this as a detailed security background check. <laughs> 
can imagine what I wanted to say to them. <laughs> the, the, uh, the issue of assassination is important. LaRouche always used the term factitious advantage, where he said, uh, you, in order to prevent them from doing what they want to do when they want you eliminated, and by the way, this issue of elimination, one of the documents in that hearing I discussed with, uh, with our lawyer, Odin Anderson, one of them was uh, a letter from the FBI director to the office in New York, or the, the office in New York to the director, <coughs> saying, we have learned that the Communist Party USA uh, is investigating LaRouche to the purpose of eliminating him, believing that his organization will fall apart without his leadership. We at the FBI concur that the organization would collapse without his leadership, and therefore we are proposing that we provide a detailed study to the, C to the CPUSA, to the Communist Party USA, a blind document in order to help them with their goal, to eliminate Lyndon LaRouche. So, he would always identify the factitious advantage, meaning the way you prevent that from happening is that you identify who it is that really wants you dead. And they say, oh, you're a kook, you're paranoid. Tell the truth. Identify who wants you dead and how they might use a, a lone gunman to do it or something, but that you identify who would pay because we're making it known who they are, just very much the way you said, because you had the information on them, right? Therefore, he was able to avoid many assassination uh, attempts, in fact, lived to a ripe old age. Uh, the other thing to say is on the false flags, and somebody earlier had said we have to expose the 9-11 for what it really is. Uh, and I agree, and I, the point is that there have been so many false flag operations which are always done in order to prevent, in this case, President Trump from doing what he wants to do. There was the takedown of the Malaysian airline in Ukraine, which they blamed on the Russians, and that was the beginning of the sanctions, the beginning of the whole operation with sanctions against Russia. There were repeated chemical attacks run by the White Helmets in Syria, who are British assets financed by the British in the USA, as terrorists, calling themselves White Helmets, helping them staging chemical weapon attacks, blaming it on Syria. Trump himself was was falsely coaxed and, and gave in to giving a couple of relatively minor airstrikes on the Syrian government in retaliation for their using chemical weapons, which they never did on their own people. It makes no sense, of course. But these kinds of false flag operations are going to continue as long as people are not willing to, f to fight to get the truth behind these kinds of things. So this, again, I, I concur with what you said. These have to be identified. You have to have the courage to identify them, knowing that you're going to be persecuted, uh, called names, but also possibly shot. You know, certainly Martin Luther King knew that when he gave the speech the night before he was killed. He said, I might not make it there with you, but we're, we shall see the promised land. You have to have that kind of courage or else you're not really living. And when you do, then there's a tremendous joy in your heart and in your mind. Uh, and life is worth living because you know you're committing yourself to the truth and not to simply uh, some personalized sense of, 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 of sense perception or sense certainty. Will do. We have about... <laughs> Unless I'm told otherwise, I believe we have about 10 minutes left. And so one of the things I'm going to do, as I said I would do it, is on the coronavirus. I'm going to propose something here. Uh, several people have written different questions, but I think they're sort of the characters two, twofold. One, uh, you have the virus itself and the question of whether or not, of course, it's natural or man-made. There's a second question, which is what can be done with respect to the surveillance technologies themselves? In what way could the kind of thing that you design within threat, is there an application that could be made to help to identify cases or interface in some fashion with medical technology? I think the third was, is this being deployed as a kind of a, a pretext, so you're creating panic uh, uh, way beyond what the circumstances are leading to the ability to do the kind of things in one sense that would dump 9-11, not in other words with the violence of 9-11, but just by shutting down whole government functions. So why don't we start with Kirk? Okay, fine. Yeah. Um 
absolutely it's possible to develop an application to provide what we learned to do, provide early warning of military aggression against the U.S., in this case, virus aggression against our interests, and against all people for that matter. What is simply needed is a set of criteria that are triggers for alerting, right, based on observable data, real data, not human made up data, and the means to report it back to some authority, some central or distributed, uh, based on those indicators. So it's eminently doable. We just need the world to cooperate, to put it into place. And I don't think it would be that expensive to do. Bill, what do you think? Uh, my, my view of the coronavirus and all that is, uh, you know, if you've ever noticed, uh, if down through the years you looked at it, the, a lot of these viruses always originate in China somewhere. So I, I started thinking, well, okay, then there must be something wrong with the Chinese chickens. Or, or else, you know, there's a weapon, bioweapons lab developing these things and they're kind of loose with their protection of the, of the device. Or it's a, a deliberate release of it. So, you know, there's some of those options. Uh, my preference is I'd like to think that there was something wrong with the Chinese chickens. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, as far as the viruses, sure, we could, we could monitor the transfer, the, the movement of people, and follow that flow with the movement of the virus. Yeah, we could do that. Well, I'll just interpolate one element, which is, um, it's not my view that it originated in China, but it is my view that when after 9-11, the uh, weaponized anthrax occurred that we don't know yet who did it. So I'll indicate that because perhaps there's a way to think about the entire process that is not about coronavirus, but a whole set of processes going back to 9-11 again that require a thorough uh, investigation. Yes, there's been something said about an individual who supposedly committed suicide by Tylenol which is what was literally said. Um, but a weaponized anthrax that was more sophisticated than could be made at Fort Detrick? A mm, little bit difficult to swallow that one. Okay, so uh, let's go back to yeah. questions. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. I, I want to thank the, uh, the panel here. We were talking about hope, and you gentlemen uh, give us all a lot of hope. You're all American heroes. And to. Uh, Bill Benny and Kurt Weeby, um, what you're doing is exceptional right now. To uh, be able to tell the American people what's going on when you have the elephant in the room, especially with intelligence, because most of us don't perceive the threats. And when Bill points out that everything's being harvested and stored, our, our cell phone communications, our text messages, our, our emails, our web searches, it's outrageous. So we talk about hope. Now, right now in the Southern District here in Manhattan, there is a grand jury supposed to be in process. There's a suit against uh, the bar and Jeffrey Berman, he's the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District. There are motions going back and forth now. Of course, the media doesn't tell you that. There is a, 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 a letter that was received from the Lawyers Committee by the U.S. Attorney said he received a petition from the Lawyers Committee of 54 pages with 60 exhibits which are dispositive of controlled demolition and bombs in the building and no one tells you about that in the sense of the regular media. But it's going on right now and as we talk that crime and we keep on coming back to 9-11 and we hear what Bill said and Kurt said, that there was apparently pre-knowledge and that the system, that thin thread would have detected it if it was made operational. Amazing. Well, there are other future possibilities as far as grand juries of government misconduct and obstruction. And then there's Shanksville, there's the Pentagon, there's the anthrax. Ironically, Dennis, I'm holding a book called 2001 Anthrax Deception by Graham McQueen, which I'm reading right now. 
uh, which talks about exactly what you were talking about. So again, I just want to say a point. I salute you all, you're true Americans. Uh, Mike, for what you experienced, uh, that's, our heart has to go out to you. But as you said, you made the best of a bad situation for those 10 years. And you come out stronger and, and, and a better leader. So you're all under fire. And again, I salute you all. Same with you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. What we're going to do, we only have four minutes left, but I'll say the following. First of all, several people have written questions, but I'm going to forward these to Bill and Kirk in particular, as well as Mike. Uh, but secondly, if you have a few questions, we will try, to, as we, we just have to end the tape, uh, but some people who have individual questions can come down and ask at the end. Um, and I'm going to ask each uh, of our panelists to uh, take a minute, uh, and that'll be me a minute, and then we'll make some announcements and then close the session. So why don't you start? I just, I'll just say I think it's extraordinary that uh, I don't think anybody has left this room for three hours or left their seat. Uh, I, I think in general, if these kinds of ideas can be laid before people who have been denied access to these ideas because of our media, because of the cultural decay. I, mean, I think this demonstrates that this, when you address these kinds of truthful and powerful ideas, it moves the soul. And this is what we can and we must do to all of our citizens and all the citizens of the world. Yeah, I would, I would just add that uh, the, the, whole, the whole concept of getting truth out to the public is really the issue here. And getting through the mainstream media, the filtering and the deception and the manipulation of the government and, and the mainstream media. Getting through that, getting the truth to people so they can make informed decisions is really, is really the hope that we have of being able to try to express the things that we know about what's going on. And so I think that's, uh, that's uh, the, main, the main issue of people understand things that know the truth, and they'll make good decisions. Yeah, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of truth. You know how important it is, and uh, we must achieve it. We have to find a way to do it. It's not a topic new to Bill and me. Uh, we've talked about the info sphere and what we might build one day if we had the financial backing to produce an outlet that goes through all the filtering based on facts to ensure that if a person comes to a certain website or a set of websites, you're going to get the truth to the best possible degree that it can be known. And it's desperately needed in this country, and I would dare say the world. We're all struggling. Can I believe that? Can I believe that? It's terrible what the media have done to us. They're far more interested in sound bites and echoing each other and arguing with each other than they are with true journalism and investigation. Just, just to add on that, just so people know, I mean, our, our, our intelligence system, our, our organizational intelligence, publishes a weekly magazine called Executive Intelligence Review and a daily EIR alert service. And uh, I strongly encourage you to, when you stop outside, to go ahead and subscribe to, to our alert and get, become part of this political movement. You've heard it, it's NSA endorsed. <laughs> Wait, 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 I can't let, let that one go. You have not seen me on this stage before. It's through the auspices of this good man, probably helped with my buddy Bill here, that I'm here today. But the importance of having a conduit for truth is absolutely, it can't be stated how important that is. And the fact that the LaRouche organization offers these kinds of things, please take them up on their wonderful offer to help. Yeah, please. Yeah, that, that.
So, so we have we have a sign up sheet back there for everybody that wants to stay in touch and work with us in various ways. We'll, we want to do more meetings like this. We do have an upcoming conference which we'll be doing April 25th. You can find out more information out there. Then again, we have Mike's book, Reflections of American Political Prisoner. Um, and as I said, we will certainly uh, we'll, we'll try to stay around as long as we can. But we are required. Uh, to uh, end at this point. I want to thank everybody for your participation, your, your, your concentration, uh, and your impending commitment to right this wrong. Thank you. Fill her out. <laughs>